Welcome to the Commonwealth Policy Center special presentation on reopening the Kentucky economy. On this edition, we have special guest, State Senate President Robert Stivers. Uh, Senator Stivers, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. All right. And you're calling us from your Clay County office over in Far East Kentucky. I am. All right. And then we also have uh, State Senate Majority Whip uh, Mike Wilson uh, calling us from actually out of state. Uh, Senator Wilson, welcome to the program. <laughs> We, we Glad just, to be here. It's good to have you. We were just chatting before we kicked off that uh, we've all been forced to uh, learn how to use the new technology if we're going to want to communicate and stay in touch with one another. And here we are all in uh, different locations talking about a timely topic, a uh, topic of reopening the Kentucky economy. And I appreciate both of you joining us to hear your perspectives as to what Kentucky has done right to reopen the economy and maybe some of the challenges that are still facing the Commonwealth as far as reopening. I wanna start with probably the biggest question out there and that is the unemployment uh, issue. Uh, former unemployment insurance director, Muncie McNamara testified before the Economic and Workforce Development Committee that the Bashir administration ignored warning signs and, improve, and approved thousands of claims without properly investigating them. Uh, today, there are 63,000 claims where people are still waiting to hear from state government as to the status of their claim. And listen to these numbers. You may have them, but the, uh, those viewing and tuning in right now may not be aware of it. But 4,900 of those claims are from March, 2,200 of those claims are from April, and 20,000 are claims that were made back in May. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, President Stivers. Could you speak to the unemployment insurance issue? A lot of Kentuckians that had never used or depended on state government before, at least in that way, as a safety net feature, uh, when they asked the state to help uh, for those that were duly uh, owed uh, unemployment insurance, they called on the state and the state uh, left a lot of people hanging. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that, uh, the unemployment uh, insurance issue? Well, first of all, I want to say the unemployment insurance issue to me is one of the biggest problems in the state of Kentucky for reopening our businesses and our whole business community. Uh, understand that this unemployment uh, insurance, UI, as we talk about, is not state tax dollars. That's an assessment on employers. So if their employee does lose their job in a situation like this, they do have that safety net. And we are just kind of the manager um, of the program. We are not the funder. Uh, it's not our dollars, it's the employer's dollars uh, you're withholding. But um, to that end, uh, we, you know, I've, I've tried to see people or hear people want to blame one administration or another but the reality was this system has been in place for a long time. The past four years, you saw unemployment drop and drop and drop because we had higher employment. Uh, there was not the need to maintain that infrastructure um, there because you weren't having the unemployment claims. And so it became a perfect storm when you were having record unemployment, low unemployment, and then all of a sudden you spiked to having super high, super record uh, unemployment claims, and you couldn't ramp up that fast. And so I, I really don't blame the mechanism or the failure of the mechanism on anybody. It's just the reality that the economy was so good that there wasn't the need for UI unemployment uh, uh, personnel to take claims. Uh, and then you get this. Now, then you get this certain set of facts and circumstances. What I will say, um, not trying to blame any administration because it's just the way it was, they probably jumped the gun, uh, the current administration, in taking claims and trying to throw too broad of a net uh, on all the individuals who may qualify to keep that safety net there. And I think that may have been the bigger part of the problem than just the system as it was set up. Well, was this a function of the governor, again, not trying to fix blame, but perhaps the governor and the administration did not anticipate as many claims filed 
uh, was that was was that a lack of foresight, perhaps? Yeah, and, and look, let's we are talking about this in a collegial way, not in a critical way, but in a constructive way, because we and I say we all of us have never traveled down a road like this. So I think sometimes the governor gets a little sensitive or a little prickly when we're not criticizing it. It's just the reality of what happened. And uh, yes, I think that is something uh, that they did not foresee, but there's a lot of things people haven't been able to foresee. And it's easy to be a Monday morning armchair quarterback too. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I'd like to bring in Senate Majority Whip Mike Wilson in. He represents Warren County, which is the Bowling Green area. Senator Wilson, has this been a hot issue uh, amongst your constituents? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. It, it's been a real hot issue. I agree with Senate President. It's been our number one problem that we've had in the state. And we are literally getting phone calls, emails, it, you know, from constituents every day. I think every one of us is probably personally handling somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, a couple of hundred. And you, you add that up to, that's not even the ones that are calling us, but if you have 138 of us, you know, we're getting thousands of phone calls and, and it's, you know, it's the governor's administration. Basically, our constituent services staff is overwhelmed with the calls, wanting some action. And uh, it's, it's definitely a real big problem. And I agree with the Senate president, too, that, you know, we've never been down this road before. And what we're trying to do as a legislature is look at all the things that we did what we did right and what we did wrong. I and mean, there's certainly there's a lot of wrong that was uh, done or not done correctly or in the way that it should have been done with unemployment. And so, you know, we, we really have to, you know, coming back into session, figure out how we're gonna handle this going forward. Yeah. Uh, Governor Andy Bashir borrowed $865 million from the federal government to shore up the unemployment fund, which dwindled very quickly. Uh, is the governor's, well, first of all, had the governor reached out to Senate leadership? Neither one of you respond as far as before he applied for that loan and received it. Did he work closely with Senate leadership on that? It hadn't talked to me, so maybe the Senate president, I don't know. No, um, I cannot remember a single conversation related to unemployment insurance or borrowing money from the federal government. We haven't had a lot, so I think I would remember one that would have uh, yeah. had that subject matter as a, as a topic, but no discussion from my perspective, except I will say this, uh, Speaker Osborne and I did write a letter and it was done in agreement with the leaders in both chambers uh, that we offered up a hundred of our employees from the LRC to work with the administration for fielding calls and trying to work through this problem. Uh, and that was really about the only communication we had. Did, they, did the administration take up on the offer to utilize those LRC employees? They did. They did. And, and um, you know, if we had specific events or specific people that we felt were, um, you know, like Mike said, reaching out to us that were in more dire circumstances, uh, they would kind of try to bump them to the front of the list um, because of the, of the need. Uh, but other than that, we, we've had very little conversation with them about the management across the board. Of, of the COVID situation, um, the directives, healthcare directives. Um, we learn about it pretty much when everybody else learns about it. And that's at the afternoon press conference. Sure. Uh, is it unusual for a governor to apply for that kind of loan from the federal government and that amount of money, almost a billion, just under $900 million? Uh, is that unusual for a governor to do that? Hey, Mike, I'm, I'm going to look at Mike. What Was it back in like 2005 or six, maybe seven, we borrowed that type of money? Uh, we've done it, but it was somewhere yes, back sir. in- Yes, sir. 
Yes, it was. It was uh, Governor Bashir Sr. who did that, uh, borrowed, I think it was uh, 900 and something million dollars that uh, was borrowed in order yeah, to shore up um, the unemployment system at that time. Yeah, that was during the the Great Recession, and and uh, it and again my dates may slip me, but somewhere in that time there was an increased assessment. Again, this is not tax dollars paid out of Frankfurt, but it's tax. It's an assessment on the employer that we retain the monies, so we had to increase the assessment to pay that off. And I think just within the last couple of years, we've just gotten that close to a billion dollar loan paid off through increased assessments of unemployment insurance. Okay. Very good. Yeah, you're right. We did, and, and it's gonna fall on our businesses again. And uh, you know, those that uh, certainly were in need that it was expanded to that actually don't pay into the system. I, I don't know how that's gonna be handled going forward because those self-employed individuals actually are drawing unemployment too as well. Yeah. And that and that, sorry, but that that's don't mean to cut in on you, but that's going to be a really hard thing when you talk about reopening the economy and reopening Kentucky for business. Yeah. When you've had these struggling businesses out there that are just barely making it, uh, be it a restaurant business or a Main Street mom and pops business, that we're going to all of a sudden have to turn around and say, your unemployment insurance assessment is going up five, 10, 15%. When they're on the edge and working on such small margins, that may hurt them even more to where they can't open. They just have to shut down. And that's that's tragic. It, Senator Stivers, is that something you foresee the uh, state Senate addressing in particular, those businesses that were hit inordinately hard uh, that are just barely making it. Uh, and let me throw this out there. So here's one particular, you mentioned the, the restaurants, but here's another particular business, the daycare centers. It, a recent report showed that 40% of all daycare centers, I believe in the country, will not be able to make it unless they have some kind of governmental help. Where, where is that? Where do you foresee the conversation in the Senate as far as helping those businesses that have small margins and that are really, really hurt by the, the shutdown of the economy? Well, first of all, you've got to understand our constitution that we're a balanced budget state. And by constitution, we can't borrow money and go in debt and have a functionally unbalanced budget. We're not like the federal government. We don't print money. Um, but we're going to have to look at things like the unemployment insurance and trying to maintain uh, some things, even to the point of being artificially low, to get these individuals back uh, on their feet. Um, what it, and, and people say, well, artificially low. Well, I would rather get 75 cents on the dollar than get nothing on the dollar. And if we bankrupt these individuals, we'll get nothing back. Um, and and so we've got to really look at some things in the short term that may be artificially low on our assessments until individuals can recoup. Um, and the, we, yeah, we're going to have to look all through anything that incentivizes businesses to come out of this. Good. Senator Wilson, I'd like to go to you. You have a thriving business community in Warren County. Have you had business leaders reach out to you? Of course, Fruit of the Loom is there. You've got the Corvette plant there. Uh, have any business leaders reached out to you asking for a particular specific kind of help? With, whether it's delayed, maybe you know, I've had unemployment insurance or what other, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I've had a lot of the uh, smaller businesses reach out to me and and particularly we have our restaurant industry that's back to 25 percent you know occupancy on that and so that's that's one of the things that uh, you know is really hurting them and as senate president uh, stiver stated you know they're in such low margins people don't realize that Restaurants work on a very, very low margin. You know, you've got to control your food costs, your labor costs, and it hurts because you the labor that they had, they were back up to 
you know, occupancy, and now they have to go back down to 25 percent. You'll just see a lot of them that will never come back. And uh, that money that they were paying, you know, for unemployment insurance is not going to be paid back into the system. And so it's really going to hurt us as a state. And so certainly those are things we got to look at. And, uh, you know, the blanket policy that was implemented by shutting down all non-essential businesses, there were certainly businesses in my area, manufacturers that had the ability to do the social distancing and uh, continue to manufacture, you know, maybe at a reduced rate, but still manufacture and do it, you know, effectively and efficiently um, without having to shut down. Uh, which could have saved a lot of jobs from going on unemployment, uh, but that was not considered. I mean, we were not considered in, in that conversation at all. And I think that's, uh, that's some things that we have to look at going forward too for businesses as well. Yeah. The Interim Joint Committee on Health, Welfare and Family Services recently met and several lawmakers expressed concerns about the secondary effects of shutting down the economy. Senator Ralph Alvarado said that the sheriff of Montgomery to County told him that suicide attempts were up 600%, domestic violence calls increased there as well. And in one of the counties that Alvarado represents, fatal drug overdose deaths were up 42%. So we see the negative effects that I I'm thinking we didn't anticipate when you shut down the economy and when people are out of work, maybe they lose their uh, support structure or their daily routine uh, that, that they're used to. And that's enough to push people to the edge. And uh, I'd like to go, go back to President Stivers. Knowing what we know now with the blanket uh, shutdown or largely a lar large part of our economy was shut down and knowing that we had a lot of secondary effects, uh, what going forward, what would be, uh, what would be that path or what would be uh, a way to balance. I guess finding balance is what I'm asking. Is there a way to find some balance between the overall health of human beings? Because we need to work, we need support groups, we need to go to church and that kind of thing. But uh, the, the blanket shutdown certainly had many more effects than I think we realized. Do you see some balance or a way to balance living oh. lives and being cautious and safe? I, I totally agree with you there. You know, and, and again, um, some people are going to take this as a criticism. It's just the reality of what happened. When you had major metropolitan areas that were seeing the spikes, what was the purpose in doing a statewide shutdown when in my area, we really didn't see any impact of, of the coronavirus until months later. We could have kept on working in this area and then as time went on, adjust appropriately. There were businesses that um, you had Walmart, and I'm not picking on Walmart, but we call them the big boxes. They were selling and they were doing everything they could do, and appropriately so, nothing wrong with it, having people in their stores uh, that weren't social distancing, they were allowed to stay open, but my little Main Street mom and pop's hardware store, not well, it wasn't a hardware store, furniture store with 10,000 square feet under roof that may have seven or eight people in there at one time, they were forced to shut down. There was no rational basis between the two because in that 10,000 foot building, it would have been very easy to keep 15 people separated. Um, and, and then just recently, I think the governor has said he's gonna put a 10 o'clock uh, curfew on all bars and restaurants. Um, what does the curfew stop if Mike Wilson's having dinner or drinking a drink at one end of the bar and I'm 15 feet away at the other end of the bar or at a dinner table having dinner? Does it matter if it's seven o'clock, 10 o'clock or midnight? There's no rational basis to that. Um, you know, just because you're stopping at 10 o'clock means everybody just goes home. There's no more sales that night in that entity that's providing services. And let me give you this fact. In that service area, 
in the restaurant service area, that portion of uh, the service industry generates about $400 million a year in state taxes. So you can see how that hurts our budget. Uh, but, and, and then apply it to everything else you've talked about, the stressors on individuals' lives um, just become great because they're out of work. Um, they're dealing with children that even if they can go to work, they don't know how to have daycare, which goes back into another component you spoke about previously. Um, so it, it's a tough time for a lot of people and you are seeing increased suicides, increased overdose, increased use of alcohol, increased use of drugs. And if you wanna look in Louisville, you're actually seeing more violence in some of the cities than you ever had before. And if I'm not badly mistaken, after this past weekend, 67 African-Americans had lost their life to COVID-19, but 68 had lost their lives to homicide. Hmm. So we're seeing the, the spillover effect of what happens when an economy shuts down, when you have a blanket approach. Senator Stivers, you bring up an example of what I would describe as maybe an arbitrary measure. Maybe there's good intentions behind it, but when you tell the bars and restaurants they need to close at 10 o'clock, uh, that seems arbitrary. It doesn't seem like there's a good outcome to that or a good purpose behind it. Do you think that kind of arbitrariness, and again, trying to be collegial and want to be respectful, but do you think that measure sows distrust or discord between some in the business community and the government? Is that what's undermining maybe the government's credibility? Uh, because there's, it, quite frankly, there's a lot of people very upset and, and don't want to follow the governor's lead. And I'm sure that happened before COVID-19 hit. But it seems to me that the, the divide is greater and there's even more anger towards government. Um, again, I will agree with you in the totality of your statement. Um, application and being consistently applied is key. Um, you have seen individuals and, and Mike has been criticized. I've been criticized. A lot of us have been criticized for saying things about could the governor do it differently? It's not that we're opposed to masks. Uh, the ends uh, are laudable. We all want to reduce the impact of this virus, but the application seems to be, as I've said, lacking rational basis. Uh, and one of the lawsuits that was filed was in Scott County, and this goes back to that consistency, a you pick it, agritourism farm that only 10 people were allowed upon a two acre plot. Now think about that. I think uh, one acre is like 44,000 square feet, uh, 210 by 210. So you have two acres, you can only have 10 people. But then you look at Kentucky Kingdom, 14 acres, they were allowed to have over 16,000 people at one time. What is the rational basis? What is the consistency? So the farmers are like, wait a minute, we don't understand. They can have a thousand per acre in a yelling, screaming, have fun atmosphere, but we can't have more than 10 on two acres where you're picking produce, fresh produce for your own use. And, and that's, again, it is not the ends, it's the means. And that's where we get, because they know my number, they know Mike's number, they know where we go to church and where we go to work and they see us out on the streets. They start complaining to us and calling us at our houses and our businesses. And that's where we wish the governor had had uh, some type of discussion with us about the recommendations before he just dropped them out. Uh, you referenced the lawsuit uh, against Governor Bashir's executive orders. Daniel Cameron said this in the motion, he called Governor Bashir's unchecked totalitarian use of emergency authority violates the inherent and inalienable rights of the people, its very nature antithetical to democratic ideals and is contrary to the customs and maxims of a free people. Uh, Governor Bashir responded via tweet. He says, with no rules, there's no chance of getting kids back to school. We will lose over $10 billion in our economy and many Kentuckians will die. I hope everyone understands how scary and reckless 
this is. And I think to his point, he was talking about trying to reopen the orchards, uh, the racing industry. Uh, there was another industry in there as well. Senator Wilson, could you, are you aware of how Kentucky could lose over $10 billion in our economy? Uh, if Daniel Cameron is successful, he was successful at that, uh, with that motion that has been appealed by the Bashir administration. So. I, I don't really see the logic in that personally, because you're losing a lot of money right now in our economy with businesses closed down and scaled back and now going to put the, uh, you know, curfew on. And, and one of the things that I want to slip back to is the whole unemployment loan that we got from the federal government. You know, our fund is gone. And so now we're relying on federal dollars to pay those claims. And you mentioned 63,000 people that have yet to get their money. And with scaling back, we're going to have put more people back onto unemployment. And, uh, you know, the, the borrowing may not be done in this whole issue. Uh, we may end up, I mean, borrowing, you know, another half a billion dollars or more. So who knows where that's going to go? This is, uh, these are dire straits and a dire situation that we are facing. And I agree that this is the number one problem we're facing. You ask anybody. And uh, I, I wish I could count the number of emails and phone calls of constituents I've had. I've never had that many on any other issue, but unemployment is, is just, you know, it's through the roof. Very good. Senator Wilson, we are running out of time, uh, but if there were one or two things that you could do if you were governor to help reopen the economy, what would those things be? Well, I would start with all of my businesses that can successfully do the social distancing and the CDC guidelines. And as long as they can maintain those, I would let them open up, you know, and protect their employees because no business, you know, that's the lifeblood of a business is good help that you get. Those are the hardest things to get. And when you get it, you don't want to let it go. And so you got to take care of your people and you know that they will. I'm certainly they're concerned about profits, but I, I would do that. That would be one of the things that I would do. Um, particularly, and then I would look at all the different areas of the state that was mentioned other earlier by Senator Stivers, his area, they weren't facing all that hot spot stuff. Our area, we are. So you don't have to have as stringent guidelines, you know, regionally as you do some other places. So those are the two things that I would really consider and look at. Very good. It's interesting you mentioned basically a targeted approach. I was in Frankfurt last Sunday, happened to be at our Frankfurt office working all weekend. I visited Buck Run Baptist Church and it was amazing the things that they had put in place to slow the spread or stop the spread of COVID all the way from requiring a mask before you get in. They had ushers that would seat you. Everybody was seated six feet apart if they weren't part of that family. And it was uh, much more careful than many of the places that we go to. And I, I was very impressed by that. Senator Stivers, we're going to close with you. We've got just, just two minutes here. Uh, if you were governor, what are one or two things that you would do to help reopen Kentucky's economy? Well, I, I'm gonna get four because Mike already talked about two. Okay. Uh, and I think those are very pertinent. Uh, the next thing I think you have to look at um, is the impact of what we've talked about, the unemployment insurance and those areas such as uh, unemployment insurance, some tax incentives, uh, some assessments that we may have to keep artificially low for a while uh, because we don't want to put people out of business where they are on those margins. Um, then the next thing I think I would look at is what can we do um, to create jobs with the dollars we have? And uh, let's talk about industries that we may be able to pump money into that you know you can do and do safely. And I will give a, an example, road construction. Uh, we know we need roads. Uh, 
You're not going to have people in close proximity to each other, not going to be sitting in a movie theater. They're not going to be at a ball game. Um, they're going to be on heavy equipment outside doing things like that. And that puts money back into the economy uh, and helps the overall infrastructure. That's an example uh, where we can do things like that, that put people to work, but in a safe atmosphere. And we need to identify those areas and really try to push money in those directions. Very good. Senator Robert Stivers, thank you so much for joining us on this Commonwealth Policy Center Facebook Live program. Appreciate your good work. God bless you. Thank you. And Senator Mike Wilson, thank you for joining us as well. God bless you. Both of you have a great weekend. Thank you. You too.